burdens are lifted at Calvary. sit down because we won't dismiss until, until everybody's ready to dismiss. Okay. okay, Mr. Lee, you ready? All right, let's walk back to Kids Church. By the way, it's a good idea not to be in the aisles when Kids Church dismisses, just in case you don't know. Matthew, Matthew in chapter 11 this morning. Matthew chapter 11, let me get rid of some things up here. You have limited facilities. Every facilities. <laughs> wow. Well, I hope the day doesn't go this way. Uh, when you have limited facilities, uh, everything becomes a catch-all. This pulpit, literally, you'd be amazed. Or maybe you could uh, start a documentary on actually what ends up in the pulpit every week. So sometimes I come in and you know try to disperse things abroad. If we don't know where it goes, then we put it in the pulpit. And there are a lot of things that fit in, the, in that qualify, that qualify for that. If you'd be interested in coming and helping out on Saturday, one of the important projects that I'd like to begin working on as well that I have mentioned and isn't in the church bulletin is that we'd like to pave the backyard. We'd like to put out some brick pavers back there. And I was actually at the company where they, uh, where they sell pavers to all the depot stores and so forth and where they make them up in Pompano a while back. 
and I asked the guy, one of the guys in the yard, I said, hey, you guys ever have like seconds or uh, cheap pavers that we could get for a better price? And he said, he said, well, nobody knows this, but he said, that pile over there, I'm talking about a pile, you know, the size of the Safeway building over here. He said, those all have to be, those all have to be destroyed and thrown away. He said, if you come here any time, he said, it's good for us not to have to destroy them and break them up. And he said, so we'll load you as many as you want if you come and get them. And so I'd like to do that sometime soon. Go pick up a bunch of pavers. And all they are would be like if you had a, like a square of them. I, I think that's what they call them, squares, where they band them together. If one of them falls off the pallet or out of the pallet, uh, or if they have irregular colors. The thing about irregular colors is that I don't know that they're irregular. You know, if they're all the same color, what difference does it make what color they are and that sort of thing. So anyway, I'd like to get we, we, uh, the last church work day. Uh, several of you folks really did a great job kind of killing all the weeds and, and getting the backyard kind of cleared. And I'd like to get them leveled and, and send pavers back there very soon. And so those are a couple of things that are, uh, that are not listed in the projects because we have so many more projects than we could list. But if you'll come Saturday and just help do some more cleaning in the backyard as well, and anybody could do that. So I want to let you know about that. All right. Don't want to talk about anything but the Word of God for the next little while. And so if you found Matthew chapter 11 in your copy of the Scripture, please look down to verse 1, and we'll read until up to verse 6 for our text this morning. And well, we will be in more of Matthew than just that part. Verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John, the th again, those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Father, please help us with our understanding of the Scripture today. And God, we do not want to look at your Word as though it's a textbook or as though it is a means to acquire knowledge. We want to look at it, God, as a book which is alive, that contains the very words of God, and which has the ability upon the exercise of our faith to literally change our lives. And I pray this will be our experience as a result of what's preached this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I have a few favorites in the Bible, favorite people. And I'm sorry about this thumping of this sound. I don't know what makes it do that, but it's been doing it for the last uh, several weeks. And so if it doesn't distract you, please don't be distracted by it. But every time I hear a thump, I, it, it uh, gets my attention. Uh, but I do have a few in the Scripture individuals that they just kind of move me when I read examples of men who loved God and lived for God. There are a few examples of that. Uh, let, me, let me tell you some of my favorite individuals that the Scripture just records their lives and their faithfulness to God. I would say, I would begin in the Scripture with Jonathan. Jonathan, the son of Saul. To me, Jonathan is perhaps one of the most relatable men in the Bible that you really don't see a failure in his life. Now, I can relate to the guys that fail. Can't you? I mean, I don't look at David and say, how in the world, man? What's wrong with you? I look at him and say, but for the grace of God. You know, I can relate more to guys that are failures than I can to guys who are not. But Jonathan is a guy that I can just really... Um, see and look at an example and say, you know, I can relate to this guy. I don't want to be like him. Jonathan, Saul's son, in many ways, after his dad had changed from whom he was. Remember when, when Saul was little in his own sight when the Scripture described it? He, he was the greatest man in Israel when he didn't see himself as anything great. But when he became, over, when he became overcome by his pride and by his power, he became a real menace, actually. And King Saul, oh boy, that thing's getting bad. I don't know if I can do anything or not. He became, in every way, the polar opposite of what he of what he had been when he was little in his own sight. But his son Jonathan, now, when you look at the things that he did, you remember when he said to his armor bearer, "Hey, 
let's steal away, let's sneak away, you and me, and let's go up to the garrison of the Philistines. Now a garrison would be an outpost of 100 people. Okay, so he said, let's the two of us go find 100 guys. And it, when they see us coming toward them, if they say, come up hither and we'll show you a thing, that's what they said, then God's given us the battle in our hands and we'll go up and fight them. I just, there's something about a guy like that that I could just admire, can't you? I mean, so let's go, let's the two of us go take on 100 people. And they did. And then you see other accounts of him. Man, when it came to courage, Jonathan didn't count his life dear. He understood the cause, much like his dear friend David did. And Jonathan was a courageous man. But Jonathan had been rejected from being king of Israel, not through fault of his own. Many times I look at God's hand, God's plan, and I look at Saul and his failures as a king, and I think, well, God, but Jonathan would have been a great king. Actually, when you look at Saul's son, Jonathan, and you even compare him with David, I mean, the loyalty, the, the purity of heart of Jonathan, but Jonathan's response when he knew that God had rejected him from being king, not because of his own sin, but because of his father's sin, was not to become bitter, not to lament his lost in opportunity, but his actual response was to say, David, God has made you to be king of Israel. You're God's anointed. And you know something? I'm going to be your best servant. There is something about a man who takes, I don't mean this in a bad way, but takes what he's dealt. Instead of lamenting what life isn't, what is missing in his life, the, the way things should have been. He takes things as they are and glorifies God and is a wonderful example. And you know, most of us need a Jonathan attitude. It's not the message this morning, but most of us could do with a Jonathan attitude. Too many of us say, you know what, I didn't have a father growing up. No, you didn't. Does God know that? You know, when I was growing up, you know, I didn't. No one ever taught me how to have a good relationship. No, you, no, you weren't taught that. Does God know that? And you could take anything that you could use for an excuse to not be right with God. And if you were like Jonathan, you'd say, "This is this is what God gave me, and this is what I have to work with." And I'm going to glorify Him. And I love Jonathan for that example. David, I like David just for his courage. But he's not one of my favorites. I, I love a lot of things. David used to be, when I was a kid, the fa my favorite guy to read about in the Bible. I just read about David's exploits. Uh, God did amazing things with him. But Daniel, that's another one of those guys. Daniel's a youth, and really his life, all of his plans, his position in Israel have been undermined from him. And literally, his future has been taken away from him as he has become one of the eunuchs in Babylon. The Bible says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. And you see Daniel live out that testimony under three different kings, and God used him to prophesy about the Messiah himself. And Daniel's a great example of a guy who, through no fault of his own, received, it seems, a very, very difficult lot in life. Joseph's another one of those guys. And I could go on and on, but I wanted to say all that to introduce us today to the reality that in the New Testament, if I were going to choose a guy, that I'd say, okay, now this guy's a great example for me. My guy's John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And I'll tell you why. Uh, we'll see it later, but I want to just look at what Jesus said about John the Baptist in this context. So I'll just kind of give you a summary of his life. Some months past, we preached about John in Matthew chapter 3, we were introduced to him. And we saw that Jesus came down to be baptized of John at the River Jordan. And this is when Jesus was surrendering to his earthly ministry, really ultimately his identification with his own death, burial, and resurrection. And he came to be baptized of John the Baptist. And we see that John the Baptist was the one who fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. Uh, the one who was to prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. But one of the striking statements that encapsulates John the Baptist's life is when his disciples came to him and reported that Jesus was doing more miracles than he had. 
and that his disciples had left many of them to follow Jesus. And John the Baptist's response was not only classic, but it was such an attitude or prayer that all of us ought to emulate. He said, the servant is not greater than his master, the disciple his Lord. And then he said, he must increase, I must decrease. And I remind you that John the Baptist had actually a popular ministry. In other words, he preached. Where, where was the primary place that we envisioned John the Baptist preaching? Where did he preach at? Location was. Where? Okay, the Jordan River. That's where he baptized. Bethabara. You know. What? Bethabara. Bethabara. And the wilderness. When we think of John the Baptist, we don't think of him in the synagogue. Do we? <laughs> we think of him out in a desert place, a barren place. And the word desert literally meaning no one's there. And Jesus asked the question of the people. He said, what went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Or what went ye out to see? And he said, a prophet? No, greater than a prophet. And he talked about that under among men. There was not a greater man than John the Baptist. Literally, John the Baptist was a preacher of the quality that people went to the desert to hear him preach. Now that's something, isn't it? I don't know. Maybe we should try this sometime. I don't know what kind of an attendance you could get if you lease a stadium. It would be interesting for a guy who's unknown like myself to rent, you know, say, the American Airlines Arena and hold services and advertise it. I wonder if anyone would come to hear. If the concessions were open, people might. Right? In other words, a lot of preachers in time past and preachers today, they'll rent out a stadium and they'll preach and people will come there. And I think a lot of times the attraction is just the event itself. I mean, they're going to have music and they're going to have, uh, you know, just different things. And just the fact that so many people are going kind of sometimes draws a crowd. What drew the crowd to John the Baptist? The location? I think not. The appearance? Well, now some of you guys we can relate to, you know, going to see a guy who was, you know, who had camel hair garment and a leather girdle, you know. I mean, you know, this guy was an outdoorsman for sure. So some of us might go out just to check out uh, John the Baptist's cool duds, maybe. But in fact, Daniel, would you go see John the Baptist's outfit? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I could take a poll on it. But the fact of the matter is, is that in his day, that would have just meant that he was kind of a wilderness guy. It wouldn't have been anything special. People didn't go to look at John the Baptist's clothing. They didn't go because of the location he was in. They went because of the manner of preacher that he was. He was very well received. And he, his message was, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And it was a very important message. And people received it. And yet when Jesus Christ's ministry began, when John the Baptist himself baptized him, in many ways... When John baptized the Lord Jesus and God spoke from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit of God came on Jesus' life and led him away into the wilderness. At that time, John the Baptist's ministry was over. It was just over. Done. Because you see, if John the Baptist were big, then Jesus wouldn't be. And so it was just absolutely necessary for John, like he said, say, He must increase... I must decrease. And I will just be honest with you, it's not really natural in any of us to decrease. It isn't. It just isn't in us. Well, we want to be prominent, don't we? We say, oh, you know, I don't want attention. I don't want anyone to notice me. But I'll tell you, we notice when people don't notice us. Don't we? And John the Baptist actually had a diminishing ministry the moment he baptized the Lord Jesus. In other words, the climax of his ministry was when Jesus, who was greater than him, came to be baptized. And he baptized him. When, the, when he came up out of the water, God's Spirit descended on him. And after that, John the Baptist was done. His calling from there was to go to prison and then later have his head taken off and put on a platter. I'm not trying to be crude, but that literally was John the Baptist's life. And so, for me... I can relate to guys, or I can relate to an example where when you look at life and you say the opportunity that that person had, and then you look at it and you think, oh, what a tragedy. 
I can really use an example where the individual doesn't see their life as a tragedy. And that's John the Baptist. And so let's look at some things about him today in the text where we're at today. Now, I, I wish I had time, and we will next week, I wish I had time to review our theme, thematic elements as we're preaching through Matthew, but uh, we do not, and so uh, you'll have to bear with me. I'm just kind of preaching a one-off sermon this morning. Uh, this is right after Jesus has sent his disciples out by twos, and by the way, Matthew chapter 10 is, is addressing his disciples in the calling that he had at that time. A lot of people take Matthew chapter 10 and make prophetic, and it isn't. It simply is Jesus sending his disciples by twos. But in verse 2 of Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 11, the Bible says, When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? And Jesus, Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which he do hear and see. And then he describes, and by the way, if you're preaching the gospel and you're preaching it from John 3, which I think is really the beginning place, you're going to preach the gospel. John 3 is where it's at. Because it's Jesus explaining how to be born again. And no one understands the gospel better than Jesus does. And so you'll preach it more succinctly and more accurately from John 3. But if you are preaching it from John chapter 3, and you remember the statement that Nicodemus made when he said, No man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 5 is a good summary. Jesus told John the Baptist's disciples, Go tell people that the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Is that a pretty good summary of Jesus' ministry, of the miracles that Jesus did that proved his God? We know that no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. Are these God-only events? Absolutely, they are. And so Jesus told John the Baptist's disciples, go tell John these things. And uh, so here, what's the question? What's the question that a lot of us have? Well, our question is, if John the Baptist knew who Jesus was, then what is this question he's asking? Isn't that your question? You know, I've heard preachers spend uh, quite a bit of time preaching about, you know, how that doubt can overtake anyone. And uh, I think that actually, honestly, that's a little bit of what this is. This is John being in a place where... Uh, he can't act out or live out his faith so much so. He's in prison. He's isolated. And so I want to ask a question about John, John the Baptist, and uh, about Jesus. And I hope it, that it'd be logical. I, I, I shouldn't say I want to ask a question. I want to answer a question. Okay, so what was going on with John the Baptist when he asked, Jesus, are you the one that comes or do we look for another? I want to just point out some facts about that. Okay, fact number one. Who was the babe that leapt in his womb for joy when Mary walked into the house pregnant with the virgin, or pregnant as a virgin with the Savior, Jesus Christ. Who? It was John the Baptist. So practically speaking, how long did John the Baptist know that Jesus was God? He always knew it, didn't he? He was born. Okay, we'll look at that in just a minute. We'll look at some additional material to that. So it wasn't because John you know, had become a late believer, and then he saw some things that caused him to doubt. Would you agree with that? No, he knew from the moment he was born that Jesus was the Messiah, and he knew that when he was preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, he knew who the king was. So that wasn't the, the, the matter that was at question. Uh, another question for you, or another, another thought... When John was in, or when John had baptized Jesus, how firmly did John believe that Jesus was the Messiah at his baptism? He didn't think he should have the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, you're the Messiah, and then right after that we have the he must increase, I must decrease. Okay, so is it true that John is at a period of doubt in his life? Is it true? This is not a trick question. Is it true that John is at a period of questioning or doubt in his life? Looks like it. Sure looks like it. He's asking Jesus, are you the one, or do we look for another? I want, to, I want to notice two things. First of all, notice who John asked if Jesus was the, really the Messiah. Who did he ask? Him. 
He asked Jesus. Now let me ask you a question. If you thought Jesus was a phony or a fraud, would you investigate him by asking for his own testimony? <laughs> I mean, seriously. Okay. Uh, are you legit? <laughs> what liar ever tells the truth? <laughs> right? Okay, so I want to point out that I believe you could say, because the Scripture indicates that John the Baptist wanted to know if Jesus really was the king, if he really, this really was the kingdom that he preached. And he really did ask, but notice who he asked. He sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the one or do we look for another? In other words, are you a fourth teller? Are you a prophet who foretells the coming of Messiah? Or are you, or are you the one that the prophets foretold? And why would John ask that question? Well, because he knows that he was the prophet who foretold Jesus. And so what he's really trying to find out is, is this, am I a foreteller of a prophet? Or am I a foreteller of Messiah? He was convinced that Jesus was the one that we look for. He was convinced of that, and yet he was at a place of doubt. And I want to say to us this morning, by way of example, that John the Baptist is actually a great example of how to doubt. In other words, if doubt can ever at any time be a good thing, the way John managed his doubt was actually the right way. Thomas, not so much. But John, when he was in doubt, went to the place to have his doubts confirmed. Now, Christian, let me help you with something. It's incredible to me the lack of logic that sometimes we use when we're in doubt in our lives. Listen, you're not beyond doubting. I'm not beyond doubting. But if you and I are going to get beyond doubting, we've got to know who to go to in our doubt. And John's a good example of that. See, when he doubted, he didn't stay in prison and say, you know, I'm going to discuss, I'm going to see what Herod really has, you know, on Jesus. Maybe there's something he knows about Jesus. You know, I wonder what, you know, and, and so on and so forth. I wonder why it is that the scribes and the Pharisees haven't received Jesus as the Messiah. Maybe I should consort with them and find out what they have to say. You know, sometimes you go to God's enemies in your doubt. Sometimes when you doubt, instead of going to God who is able to remove your doubt, you go to the very place where doubt is sown. Listen, my friend, sin is not the place to go when you're in doubt. A lot of believers, when they doubt God, go to sin. As though there's going to be some sort of consolation in sin that confirms that their doubt is correct. That living for Jesus is not worthwhile. That the things that you're questioning God about are legitimate questions. And you go to the one who's a liar instead of the one who's never told a lie. And I love the example of John the Baptist even in doubt. How, how much doubt is it when you're struggling in your faith, and you go to the one who's able to increase your faith. John the Baptist is a great example in doubt. And, and friend, I'm just tell you something, I've been helped by this. Been able to look at, okay, if I'm if I'm in doubt, if I'm struggling with doubts, let me do it the way John did. Because he went straight to Jesus, in a manner of speaking. He couldn't physically go to Jesus, but he sent his disciples to Jesus, and Jesus' answer was, well regarding the things that I've done, the blind receive their sight. Who's able to give the blind their sight? Only God. The lame walk. Who's able to heal the lame? Only God. Uh, the deaf hear? Only God. The dead are raised up? <laughs> Only God. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now, let me ask you a question. If you're going to list the miracles that Jesus did, that last one, would that be in your list? Is it an accident when the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness? Is it a mistake that we hear the supernatural and then Jesus says, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them? I'm not saying this isn't miraculous to preach the gospel to the poor. I'm not saying that isn't miraculous. But in the list Jesus puts it in, He puts in a list of things that only God could do and then includes in it something that John did. 
You notice it? He puts a list of things that only God can do. And at the end of the list, he includes something which John once did. Preach the gospel to the poor. And here, Jesus is again confirming to John the Baptist, yes, I am the Savior. I am the King that you're looking for. And yes, John, you are no longer needed. <laughs> to us, that seems cruel, doesn't it? Does, do you feel, would you feel crushed if you were John? And Jesus said, I do this, 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 and this. And John thinks, I never did that. And then you mention the thing that John did, which was preach the gospel. And you say, and the gospel's being preached. Friend, I have to say to you that if I'm John, that actually isn't as hard a pill to swallow as you and I think, because that actually was John's very concern. John's very concern was, is the gospel being preached? If I'm in prison, and if Jesus isn't the one we look for, who's going to preach the gospel? And it's a pretty solid question. It's a pretty legitimate question. And I want to say to you that when you have a doubt, let it be in the area of, am I needed to serve God, or is God's work being done? Not in the area of, is God able, or is God who He says He is? See, Jesus actually specifically puts his finger on the area of John's concern. John's concern, actually, I do not believe, is not whether Jesus is supernatural God. I believe that John's concern is whether or not the poor are going to have the gospel preached to them. And the area he actually doubted Jesus in is the same one a lot of Christians doubt Jesus in. How much does God love the lost? How much does God love the lost? I want to remind you about a couple of things. First, God loves the lost so much that He died for them. And John the Baptist, though he, according to Jesus, is the greatest preacher of men that ever lived, John the Baptist didn't love the lost enough to die for them. Jesus did. How much does Jesus love the lost? Well, enough to die for them. Now here's a question a lot of us have as well. Does God need me? Is my life important enough for me to actually have a purpose? Does, my, does God need me to preach the gospel? You know there are two questions here. There are two answers to the question here actually. The answer for John was no. God doesn't need you. You say, Pastor, don't say that. What a cruel thing. No, John the Baptist had a calling. He was the fourth teller. He was the one who preached that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. His calling was to prepare the way of the Lord. But when Jesus came, John was no longer needed. And if John had remained what he was when Jesus came, it would have literally diminished the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friend, sometimes you and I, we struggle with transition. I watch preachers all the time when they come to a place where it seems as though, you know what, God had a great ministry for you, but it's time for you to pass the mantle on. Instead, hold on to the ministry and kill churches. I think it's probably one of the, the biggest struggles we preachers have is getting out of God's way sometimes. And simply saying, you know what, yes, God used me, but uh, I need to be willing to let God use someone else. You know, Sunday school teachers have the same problem. You know, sometimes in some churches, Sunday school teachers become entrenched. I mean, it's I am the adult Sunday school teacher, the adult class Sunday school teacher. And sometimes, sometimes God wants us just to get out of the way. Uh, you know, visitation bus workers, singers, choir members. We're not willing to let God do anything more than what He could do with us because we don't want to be out of the way. Now, is there any new into on what I'm saying today? Not at all. Not at all. I don't think we need to get rid of our pastor. I don't think we... Well, we might. I don't think we need to get rid of our uh, Sunday school teachers, but I am simply saying to you that there will come a time in your life when if God is going to continue working beyond you, 
that you're going to have to diminish so that he can increase. And that's an area of doubt in our lives many times, the area of diminishing. You know, let me be less so that Christ can become more. Let me go ahead and pass on. Let me go ahead and step back off the scene so God can take things further. I'm amazed at sometimes at even church transitions, how that sometimes it seems that the next guy, everything the pastor before him was, the next guy is, and then he takes it to the next level, takes it beyond that. But you know, sometimes a guy won't let somebody come in behind him because he feels threatened. He's John the Baptist in his mind, and nobody's going to preach the gospel the way that he did. No one's going to have the power of God in his life the way that he did, and so he won't get out of the way. And Jesus is here telling John the Baptist, hey, John, it's okay to get out of the way. Now, I don't know about you, but there's some comfort in this reality. There is some comfort for me in knowing that the world will continue to revolve without me. Now, for some believers, it's an excuse. It's a reason not to serve God. It's a reason not to, to follow the Lord. It's a, well, you know what? God's gotten on pretty well without me, and He'll continue to do so. No, friend, in your day, in your generation, God has a plan for your life. See, that's the second caveat here. That's the second part of this. God does have a plan for your life. You don't age out of serving the Lord Jesus. You know, not very long after God's work for John the Baptist was finished, God went ahead and took John the Baptist. If God hasn't taken you, then friend, find comfort in the fact that God still has a plan. He still has a purpose for you. So many times we think, well, you know, God could use somebody else, and there's people that are... And we think it's humility, but actually it's selfishness, and it's actually pride. There are people that could preach the gospel better than me. There are people who could teach better than me. You know something, my friend? The Great Commission is not written to the most talented, the most skilled, or the people uh, that have the best results. It's written to all of us. Amen. And we need to serve the Lord. And we need to stop looking about and comparing and asking, you know, who am I or who is this person? We simply need to know who we are in Christ Jesus. And John is a great example of knowing who to go to when in doubt. He went to the right place. And he's a great example of actually being what he was supposed to be all the way to the end of his life. And that's what Jesus is explaining further in the passage. I'd like to read it and then we're pretty much going to be out of time this morning. In verse 7, the Bible says, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What wind ye out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? Hey, have you never seen a reed blown around by the wind? Is that why you went out there? Uh, and and uh, what wind ye out to see? Verse 8, A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what wind ye out for to see? And Jesus said, A prophet? Yes. Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I sent my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. In Malachi, if you were to look at this, Malachi chapter 5 and verse 6, you would see this prophecy of the Scripture that John the Baptist fulfills. And I'll remind you that Malachi would have been the last of the prophets before God was silent to his people, national Israel. He spoke of of putting away uh, his people, Israel. And literally for a period of almost 400 years, God was silent. And this prophecy in Malachi chapter 5 is the one that people that were looking for God to speak again were waiting to be fulfilled. You know, in Daniel, we have the prophecy of when Christ will be born. If you turn to Malachi chapter 5, somebody turn there. Is anybody there? Why don't you go ahead and read verse 6 for me? Hopefully, I gave you the right reference. Go off my memory. Chapter 4. Is it chapter 4, verse 6? Okay, please read that then. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Okay, all right. So this is the prophet that is prophesied that is going to turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers uh, to the children. And so this is that one that much like the prophet Daniel uh, was prophesied that he was going to come. Yes, in verse 5, I got my numbers back, turned around. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful 
day of the Lord. Now, in the Revelation, we see that this is a dual fulfillment prophecy because Elijah is going to come again. I believe he'll be one of those witnesses that's going to preach. But Jesus here said that for you people that are looking for Elijah to come, I am telling you this is Elijah. This is the one. Back in Matthew chapter 11, uh, Jesus said in verse uh, 10, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered the violence, violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. In verse 14, And if ye will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. And this is the Malachi reference. He that hath two ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus said, you know something? This John the Baptist is the individual that when God was not working was your promised preacher that's going to prepare the way of the Lord or is the Elijah, that Elijah which is to come. If you were to go to Matthew chapter, I believe it's uh, 17, and uh, look there as well. Matter of fact, let's do it very quickly. I know we're, we're short on time, but Matthew chapter 17 I believe it's verse 11, verse 10. His disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elijah or Elias must first come? And, and Jesus answered, Send of them, Elias truly shall first come and restore all things. And verse 12, But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Then the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Now we recognize from the scripture that there is a dual fulfillment about Elijah. We're going to see Elijah again. He's going to be one of those witnesses. But my friend, John the Baptist was the spiritual Elijah. He was the one that came and prepared the way of the Lord. And he's the one that people actually killed and actually put him to death. And when you look at John the Baptist's life, sometimes you look at it and you say, oh, what a tragedy. Do you think that way sometimes? Do you feel sad for John the Baptist when he had such a vibrant, fruitful ministry? And then out of nowhere, not out of nowhere, but all of a sudden the realization of what he prophesied happened, it was fulfilled, Jesus came, and now he goes from having a vibrant, useful ministry to not being needed. Does that make you a little sad for John the Baptist? I asked you if it makes you sad for John. I do. I feel for the man. I feel like, wow, how tough would that be? How tough would it be to be relegated uh, unuseful? I watch, I watch dear folks, family, and so forth get to the age where they can no longer do things, and, and that becomes more and more increasingly me. There are things that I, there are things, places I avoid because I know that I'll do things that I can't do or I shouldn't do. For instance, athletic events. It's very, very difficult for me to show up where somebody's playing basketball or football or, or wrestling or something like that and not want to participate. But I know that if, I, if I'm there and I get involved in it, my mind doesn't know that my body can't do the things it used to do. And I'll try things and something will break. And it's a little tough. I remember my wife's granddad, how frustrated he would get after he got cancer. And he just couldn't do the things he wanted to do anymore. I mean, if somebody's putting a roof on, he wants to get on the roof. And, you know, in your 80s, uh, you, and you, when you've got bone cancer, you shouldn't be on the roof. And I remember uh, just how frustrated and how angry. And I can relate to that because I always want to be able to do everything. I, wanna, I don't want anyone to have to help me. I want to help everyone. Sometimes it's tough for us, but let me just say to you, I don't think that's the case for our dear friend John the Baptist. Let's put it in a closer perspective. If you had the privilege of being the one who was the fourth teller, the preacher, that God the Son is come to earth to die for sin, to take care of the problems of the whole world. And if you had the privilege of preaching Jesus Christ and Christ came and you even had the privilege of baptizing Him, kind of passing the mantle of your ministry, your disciples over to Him to become His disciples, would there actually be anything at all to regret? 
Do you know when we actually come into place, into the place of someone who's far greater than us, it oftentimes settles our urge to try to, to be the greatest. Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player uh, that ever has lived. I try to say controversial things sometimes just for fun, but it's actually true. Michael Jordan's the all-time great basketball player. And uh, probably if Michael Jordan showed up at our church's three-on-three -three tournament and wanted to play on the geezer team, Rolando and I wouldn't mind sitting on the bench. Rolando might mind. He'd be like, oh, don't put Michael Jordan on the bench. I'm not giving up. All right. But the reality of it, you see what I'm saying? In other words, if, if I want to see the team win and... You know, we were recruiting geezers for the geezer team. I'll sit the bench for Michael Jordan. Now, that's humanly speaking. Realistically, no prophet, great as they may be, and Elijah was that great prophet, and John the Baptist was the great prophet in the spirit of Elijah. Realistically speaking, though, there's a big difference between a prophet and the Son of God. Isn't there? And when you look at it from that perspective, do you think John the Baptist is saying, you know, put me in. Let me preach. When Jesus said the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Listen, do you hear do you, do you get it? Do you hear what we're saying now? Put me in. Let me preach. Now, I'll confess to you that I have visited churches before and I've sat in services where the preaching was so terrible that even though I wanted to hear preaching, I wished I were preaching. <laughs> I hate to say it, but that happens. But my friend, if it were the Lord Jesus, I'll go ahead and lay down somewhere in the back and just listen. I'll just bask in being in the presence of God. And that was the reality for John the Baptist. Did John come to Jesus with some doubt? Well, we could say yes. But we could say that in his doubt, at least he went to Jesus. Did John the Baptist come wanting to know where he stood? What his position now was? Well, we could say yes. But when Jesus said, the poor have the gospel preached unto them, I don't know about you, but if I'm John the Baptist, I'd say, thank you, good. All right. No regrets. And my friend, are there any regrets about the life of John the Baptist, the ministry of John the Baptist on his side? Oh, we look at him and we feel sorry for him, but I promise you, when he said the servant is not greater than his master and the disciple is not greater than his Lord, he meant it. And if you struggle with preeminence, and you struggle with stepping aside and letting God work either through someone else or God work without you. You have a problem with allowing Jesus to have the preeminence that He deserves. If you want to practice humility, if you want to come to a very, very real view of yourself and who you are, and that is humility, just go to Jesus and look at who He is. And my friend, in every way, you'll find that He's adequate you'll find that in every way He is better than you and better than what you could do and better than what you could imagine could be done. And so we need to look to Jesus. Father, thank You so much for this simple message today. God, it's not brilliant. It's just simply trying to unpack what is plainly there for us. And Lord, this is such a key for believers who struggle with doubt to know where to take their doubt, to take it literally to Jesus. God, you will always satisfy the doubt. And then, God, when sometimes we find our position or our worth or who we perceive ourselves to be, when we perceive or we think that we're somehow under threat or competition, God, help us just to see Jesus and what Jesus is and to compare ourselves in that way so that we can rest in being what you've called us to be. Lord, I just thank you so much 
for the ministry of John the Baptist and then for the explanation that you gave about this man who as far as men are speaking was the greatest to ever live on earth. And yet God the reminder that in the kingdom of heaven the least is greater than John the Baptist. Help us to be mindful of these truths as we strive to serve you. Give us this perspective we ask in the name of our Savior Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to have an invitation this morning. It's just going to be very, very simple. First of all, you can never assume, I, as far as I know, every person I know here today has trusted Jesus as your Savior. But I don't want to assume that. If you're here this morning and you'd say, you know something, I don't know. I don't know that God is my Father. I don't know for sure that Jesus is my Savior. The matter of eternal life is one I have not settled. Well, I have Brother Chuck Todd standing in the back of the room, and he's there primarily to help you to know the Gospel and know that you have eternal life. That hasn't been the message this morning. It is what was preached by Jesus and by John the Baptist. And we want to make sure that you don't leave this place with that full assurance that you have eternal life. The message this morning really, though, has been uh, to the people who love Jesus. And boy, if you wanted to describe somebody by just saying he loved Jesus, this man John the Baptist, he'd be that guy, wouldn't he? And so this message this morning has really been more of an example for the believers. And I see two things this morning that are very, very clear in the Scripture that you and I could, could be helped by. The first thing that I see is that you and I in a time of doubt must know where to take our doubt. John had doubt, but he took it to the right place. And you know, sometimes we don't do that right. If God's convicted you about that, maybe there's a doubt in your life right now. I don't know whether it's about God's provision or God's plan for your life or Christ's sufficiency in all things. I don't know what the specific doubt is, but if there's a doubt in, there, in your life, would you take it to the right place? Take it to the right place. That would be the first decision you could make here this morning during our time of invitation. And the second one is this. Would you be willing to be what God wants you to be? In other words, instead of looking and thinking, well, God, you know, I should be this, or if, if I'm diminished, then what happens to me? Would you just simply see yourselves in light of who Jesus Christ is and find your sufficiency in who He is rather than lamenting what you cannot be? So many times we look at what could have been or what we think we should be instead of looking at Jesus and who He is. If you'll look at who Jesus is, my friend, not only will it have the same effect as taking your doubt to Him, but you'll actually see that He's sufficient for all things. And when you have a right perspective of yourself, there will be no regrets. You won't look at your life and say, this could have been. You'll look at your life and say, Jesus did everything in God's perfect plan. All right, so we're going to have a hymn of invitation this morning, and it's going to be about trust. If you take your blue hymn book and open up to page 252, I'm going to conclude our service, or our, begin our uh, invitation with a word of prayer. And uh, actually, you know what? We won't. We're just going to begin singing, only trust Him. And if God's spoken to you, then the invitation is for you. It's a matter of taking your doubt to Jesus, or a matter of trusting. If God's spoken to you while we sing, instead of singing, maybe you could just remain in your seats while the rest of us stand. Maybe you'd feel that it would be right and reverent to bow and uh, just to kneel where you're at. Maybe you need someone to pray with you. And I'd be here available for that, or the Taj would be available for that. But as we sing only trust Him, would you let the Holy Spirit of God examine and evaluate your heart and reveal yourself to you? And if you've struggled with a matter or an area of trust in your life, would you give it to Jesus? Let's stand. We'll begin singing. Page 252, only trust Him. And as we sing... You do business with the Lord as He's spoken to you individually. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord. And He will surely give you rest. We haven't closed the invitation. Uh, go ahead and take it to God on the second verse, verse 2. For Jesus shed his precious blood, which blessings to be so. Now, He will save you, He 
in the Scripture that are represented. I always think of John 14, 6 when I think Jesus is the truth and the way. And so let's go ahead and sing verse 3. It'll be our last hymn of the invitation, or last verse of the invitation this morning. Yes, Jesus is the truth, the way that leads you into rest. Believe in Him without delay, and you are fully blessed. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him. safely for tonight, and uh, have our hearts spoken to you, Lord, and I thank you uh, for what you're going to do in our lives, uh, not just the rest of today, but uh, this week in Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.